Good morning, Booktube. I noticed this morning in looking at my YouTube channel that I haven't made a video in a day. I thought I would do a video tonight since it's a Monday. It is October the 1st, 2018. It is 8.37 in the morning here in West Michigan. This morning I heard thunder. It rained during the night. It is dark gray and rainy outside, cold. Here by Lake Michigan. And uh, yeah, I thought about doing a, a video tonight, a Monday Reads. But then this morning I was uh, I was reading for devotions the Theoretica Practical Theology Pramagama Volume One. As you know, this was just translated out of the Latin, but and this is by Petrus Van Manstrit, and it was translated by Todd N. Reasoner. This is put out by Reformation Heritage Books, which is just here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, as you know, uh, it says here it was edited by Joel R. Beakey. Uh, for many, many years, Dr. Beakey is someone I have used to listen to his sermons, and I have his books, and he is the president of Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He teaches historical theology. He's a minister of a big church, and he is uh, very prolific <laughs> in writing and publishing. So anyway, uh, even though I'm not into Reformed Covenantal theology as I was when I was younger, I still like to read it. So this is the first volume of six that's going to come out. And uh, so anyway, in this volume, it starts out with his, uh, his life and work, the, the life and work of Petrus van Manstrit, who lived from 1630 to 1706. And then it goes into a funeral oration. He died and then this minister gave a funeral oration. And then the next thing is the best method of preaching. And so I've been reading that. And see, it's called The Best Method of Preaching. Dr. Beakey has published The Best Method of Preaching in a pamphlet, but they, apparently when this was published originally back there in the 17th, 18th century, uh, they would put in the front of the theoretical practical theology, the method of the best method of preaching. As you can see by the title that the master believed that theology should be practical. As he defined, theology is can be defined as uh, holy living, something like that. I think that's... Um, so, maybe it's in the beginning here. Let me see here. The nature of theology... Something like that. I can't remember now. If I had Ames with me, William Ames, I think that's how he did define theology. Um, but anyway, so I was reading this this morning, and then I was thinking about, well, I would show you some of my favorite books on preaching. <laughs> uh, as you know, I've been down the lower level since Carol's been gone off to New Mexico, getting my books in order and uh, I was down in the storage room where I have all my diaries and a large part of our my Christian library and I was going through those looking at that, all those books and I came across my books on preaching uh, many 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 years ago when I was in Bible college and seminary I always collected books on preaching and also I had to take homiletics 
when I was in seminary uh, classes on preaching. And one of the books, but there, I had to use, for example, this book here. This is by R. L. Dabney on preaching lectures on sacred rhetoric. Now, Dabney was a Southern Presbyterian. He uh, he lived from 1820 until 1898. He was uh, from the South. He uh, he wrote a biography on the great Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. I have his lectures on theology. I have his I have a lot of his writings. I'll show those someday. But we had to use this in seminary. But then there are some very classic books on preaching. And I would look for these when I lived in Grand Rapids. I would go to this Christian bookstore that had downstairs, they sold old used books, rare or used Christian books. And I look for this book. This is a book on preaching by another uh, Presbyterian minister. He was pastor of the Brick Presbyterian Church, New York. This was published in 1849. This is the power of the pulpit or thoughts addressed to Christian ministers and those who hear them by Gardner Spring. This is a very classic book on preaching. And then one of my favorite books on preaching is this one. This is really old. This is called The Earnest Ministry, The Want of the Times by John Engels James. Uh, this was published in 1848. And when I was reading this, this, I was looking at it this morning before I made this video, I noticed that there was this, well, my, these are, I use these for bookmarkers. As you all know, I use index cards for bookmarkers. And uh, I, I was reading this, and it was a chapter on chapter five, Nature of Earnestness, illustrated by specimens from various authors. And then I noticed that he quoted Dr. Uh, Tom, uh, Reverend Thomas Doolittle. And he's quoting from a sermon that he says is found in the morning exercises entitled, How We Should Eye Eternity So That We May Have Its Influence on All We Do. So he's, he's using this sermon by the uh, Reverend Thomas Doolittle was a 17th century English Puritan. And he's using this sermon, he's quoting, he's going to quote from this sermon to give an illustration of what it means to be earnest. That when we preach, he says to ministers, when we preach, there should be earnestness. And so then he quotes from this sermon by Thomas Doolittle. Now, I so happen to have the morning exercises in my library. And I came across these yesterday when I was straightening up the back room and I thought I'd show them to you. The morning exercises, I got these when I was in Bible college. They were published in 1981. Maybe I got them when I was in seminary. I think I was I, I got married in 70, I probably got these when I was in seminary. They're called the Morning Exercises at Cripplegate, or several, conscience, several Cases of Conscience Practically Resolved by Sundry Ministers. Now, these are sermons by the, the, the English Puritans. I mean, this is an incredible, it's a sixth volume this is volume one of Cripplegate, Puritan Sermons from 1659 to 1689 in six volumes. See, this is the, the second volume. This is the third volume of or Morning Exercises. And then you have volume four of the Morning Exercises, Puritan Sermons, 1659 to 1689. And then you have volume five of the Morning Exercises. And then you have volume six. It, they're almost like a practical th theology. 
it's like going, they preaching through almost all the doctrinal kind of, uh, you know, on, on sin and salvation and all these different Christian doctrines. But I could go through these all morning, but I just wanted to read the sermon that uh, John Angles James quotes in his book on preaching on what it, on earnestness. And this is the sermon. It's found in volume four of the Puritan Sermons uh, Morning Exercises at Cripplegate. And it's on the, it's the first sermon in the volume. And it's on continuation of the morning exercises. Sermon 26 by Reverend Thomas Doolittle. And it's the sermon's titled, How We Should I Eternity, That It May Have Its Due Influence Upon Us in All That We Do. So that's the sermon title. And the text is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. What we look at, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Second Corinthians four, verse eighteen. Now I can't read the old the whole sermon. It's a it's an incredible piece of literature. Not only gospel preaching and an example of earnestness, but it's just it's like you know people in book two are reading William Shakespeare. <laughs> well, Thomas Doolittle was in the same historical time period as William Shakespeare. So if you want to read great literature, read the English Puritans. But he says here, uh, I'll just start here. Uh, Two, this looking is by eye of faith. Looking is believing. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when it looketh upon it, shall live. Numbers 21.8 the object and act are both expounded by Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, verses 14 and 15. 3. This looking is with the eye of love, though in philosophy the affections as well as the will are blind powers, yet in divinity the eyes are put for the affections. While thou set thy eyes upon that his lo- upon that which is not. Proverbs twenty three five in the eye of the Lord denotes his love. And believers that love the coming of the unseen Savior are said to look for it. We love to look at what we love. For this loving this looking is with an eye of desire, which is expressed by the eye that he seek not after your own heart and your own eyes. Everything desirable is in, is in thine eyes. If I have withheld the poor from the desire, or have to cause the eye of the widow to fail. Job 31, verse 16, the eye is index of the desires of the heart. This looking is with the eye of hope. The eye is put for hope. The things are not seen or looked for by hope. And the things hoped for are the object of our looking, looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2, verse 13. In short, the sum is as as is as if it th- a things, a firm belief of them, a fervent love unto them, urgent desires after them, lively hope and patient expectation of them. We faint not in all our tribulations. Having opened the eyes which we are to look at eternal things, I perceive the manner of our looking. There is a looking unto them. There is a looking into them by studying the nature of them to know more of their reality, necessity, and dignity of them, which things are angels to look, which things the angels desire to look into. First Peter one verse twelve. If angels do, men should. There is a looking for them. Either we look for the things that we have lost, look till we find, as the man for his lost sheep and the woman for her lost silver. And there is a looking at them, which is not in idle gazing at the unseen eternal world, but practical, lively, affecting look at the, look in this, this manner of following. 
We should look at eternal things with such an eye of faith that presentable them unto us, though they are not they are yet to come. Hence, hope for the evidence of things not seen. Faith, intellectual existence, though absent, as if they were present, being promised, are sure as they are already possessed. Faith convinceth of a thing while it looks to the revelation and testimony of God, and any argument brought forth from natural reason should do, does give us firm consent to the certainty and reality of eternal things, though unseen as to anything which he beholdeth with his eye or perceiveth by apprehension of any sense, because our eyes may be deceived, but God neither can deceive nor be deceived. Look then for the instance at the coming of Christ with such an eye of faith, as if your bodily eye you saw him descending from heaven in flaming fire with glorious attendance, as you heard the trumpet sounding and the cry made, Arise, ye dead, and come to judgment, at which command, as if you saw the dead quickened, and peeping out of their graves, you see why they are raised, as if you saw the wicked come forth fearfully amazed with vile and filthy, filthy bodies, like toads from their holes, with pale and ghastly countenances, with trembling hearts, their knees for horror, knocking against another, tearing their hair, smiting on their breasts, crying out, What is the matter? What meant the loud alarm, the thundering call, the awakening us out of the deep sleep of death? Oh, the Lord has come, the slighted Christ has come. Come, how does he come? How? Clothed with vengeance, with fire in his face, and his wrath like fire burns before him. Because of indignation, the heavens melt over our heads, the earth burns under our feet, and all is flames around about us. Oh, terrible days such as this we never saw. Oh, the storms, the storms, oh, such burning, scorching storms we never saw nor felt before. We have been sleeping all the night of death, and the morning has come. The day does dawn, dawn. Oh, it is broad day all about. We are wont to wake and go to work and go to sin, to swear and lie, to drink and take our pleasure. But now we wake and must to hell, to pain and punishment. Now we must go forth from God to devils, from the only Savior to eternal torments. Oh, what a day is this! What day! It seems to be rather night than day. For it is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet alarm against us, impenitent sinners, and to us all it will prove the great damnation day. When our souls and bodies by death were separated, it was a sorrowful parting, but this is a sore meeting. See, that's earnestness in preaching. <laughs> so, the whole sermon's like that by Thomas DeLille. It's just... It's one of the great gospel sermons. And that's earnestness in preaching. And um, every time I read that sermon, it just... Because I believe in, that there is an eternity. <laughs> there is an eternity of, of being with God and the eternity of being separated from God. And so it's very serious when you talk about preaching. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's what I thought I'd share this morning. Like I said, this is... Monday reads. I'll probably make a video tonight. I have to volunteer at the book nook again this morning. I take a van load of books. I got, I think, seven boxes of books. I've taken almost 16 boxes of books to the book nook, to the library, to be sold in the bookstore and sold at this library, Friends of the Library used book sale in the spring of the next year. So as far as my diary on October the 1st, 2018, on page 802. So I'll sign off. Thank you for the new subscribers. Thank you for the questions. And I hope you have a good new week, a good new month. And until next time, bye.